great. So good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. And today, as we, um, as we begin to um, continue to delve into the themes and juxtapose the themes of designing and managing as designing and, and how, how that might bring and come, bring to life this whole domain of sustainability and sustainable value, um, we've just got some great, great um, speakers and processes in place. I think if I had to say kind of a, a, a nuance today is that we're nudging in the direction of action. Um, and the question is going to be, you know, how might we um, at multiple levels begin to advance the vision and practice of sustainable value, sustainable value innovation, um, businesses as an agent of world benefit. How might we do that within our spheres of influence, um, within our universities, within our corporations, um, globally, and so on? Um, so I think that's kind of an overarching movement towards how might we, and, and use the design mind to begin thinking about potential initiatives. Last, at the, you know, it's kind of a, as I described before, we're, it's kind of a merger of a conference and an action-oriented setting here. Um, and in the last Global Forum, for those of you that were here, you might remember it, there were a number of very powerful initiatives that were born. I mean, very powerful. I'll give you one example. Uh, Manuel Escudero is here from the UN Global Compact, um, but one of the conversations that got started about midway through the conference, um, like we are today, um, one of the conversations that got started was around principles for management education, the realization that our management schools have such an impact. And, um, and a group got together and, and Manuel Escudero was chairing that group and they gave birth to the idea of what's called principles for responsible management education. Well, those principles were f a group and a team continued to work on those, developed these principles as a body of belief, um, presented them at the 2007 um, United Nations Global Compact meeting in Switzerland with Ban Ki-moon and about a thousand business leaders. And by the way, it was the business leaders who were saying, we aren't able to get the right kind of people from our management schools. And so that was also part of the impetus for this. But it was a wonderful set of principles around, uh, around sustainable value creation and the call for that. And today, um, I don't know, Manuel will talk later, but I think there's almost three or 400 or, um, business schools that have signed on to, to these in their research, in their education, and so on. So anyway, some, um, you know, while uh, this is a conference with lots of papers and workshops, we also have a clear intention to come out with some action, and today we'll start moving into that direction. Um, let me just give a quick overview. It's a wonderful day. And also, just I, I wanted to thank Nancy Adler and, and everybody who helped make last night possible at the museum. Um, the... I was looking through Nancy's book, and, um, and there was a piece in there that reminded me of one of my interviews when we did these 2,000 interviews on business as an agent of world benefit. One of the interesting things is that until we have a new vocabulary and how much words create worlds, you know, in the Wittgenstein kind of sense, um, until we have the language, we're not going to be moving in this direction very rapidly. And so when we were doing interviews with some people in Sweden, um, you know, I, I loved the term and the language. They, they said, you know, literally, um, the translation of the word business, it's called in, in Swedish, it's nering sliv, nering sliv. And it literally means the nourishment of life. Um, and that's their term for business, the nourishment of life. And I thought about Bill McDonough's imagery again around the intimacy of the whole and so on. So um, I think as part of our exploration, it's the language also that's going to move us in this new direction. So this morning, we're going to start with a, um, a, a design panel and a great group of people um, to um, to launch our, continue to deepen our conversation on design. Dick Buchanan is going to moderate the panel. Um, he was the former dean of the design school at Carnegie Mellon. We're fortunate now to have him at Case Western Reserve University. Um, and it's a great panel. Um, Jennifer um, McNulfi from Herman Miller will be talking about Herman Miller's sustainability and design. Um, Kenneth Gergen, one of the top, top, I mean, 
leading minds in the world on the social construction of reality, um, a very, very deep thinker about our theories of knowledge. And I think the constructionist methodology and meta theory that he proposes is um, very, very, um, could powerfully inform a design um, mind. And so I think it'll take this discussion on design to a whole nother level. Um, Jason Pearson, um, really looking at systemic and whole system design, um, you know, larger and larger scales, like how do you create a whole global packaging revolution and so on. And he's got this wonderful framework for thinking about um, massive design and, and, and some great metaphors for thinking about that, um, which makes the massive design feel simpler. And then Peter Coughlin, um, a very, you know, just outstanding colleague and friend from IDEO, um, and he's going to lay out some of the thoughts from the perspective of IDEO. Um, after that, Peter is going to join us and lead us through an actual design session, um, a two-part session starting today and then continuing tomorrow, where we go through and, and take some of the opportunities areas that are emerging here in our conversations and say, let's begin to actually design some prototypes of some initiatives. L not unlike that design of the prototype of the principles for responsible management education, that the idea is once you prototype these things and build and take concepts into visual form and so on, that the momentum and the possibility of them coming to fruition just skyrockets. And um, so Peter's going to, we're just really fortunate to have Peter here to work us through that. At lunch, we've got a couple neat videos um, prepared specifically for the conference from Peter Senge. Um, and everybody knows Peter Senge's work and, and his um, whole system designing concepts. Um, and Russell Eckhoff, um, one of the great um, early, early thinkers in the whole design field. Um, after lunch, um, we have um, Roger Martin, who's just um, published uh, a, a terrific book called The Opposable Mind, and the, the mind that can hold opposites together and the creativity that comes from that. He also happens to be dean of the Rotman School of Business, where um, they have made design a very, very central theme in their management education and management school. Um, so he brings um, just a terrific um, um, congruence with the theme of this conference. Um, then again, we'll have workshops and paper sessions um, and, and um, the choices that you'll have with those. Um, and then we have a, a, a wonderful dean's panel um, to really, from the perspective of our management school deans, you know, and what they see and the innovation that's required in management education. Um, we'll be talking about, you know, is this a time of evolution in management education or a time of revolution in management education? Um, you know, and, and where are we when judged against the needs of our times as it relates to preparing leaders with responsibility and vision and innovation capacity? Um, so with that, we have great, um, great, great lineup again. Um, Ira Jackson, the dean of the Drucker School. Um, I've been getting close with Ira and his thinking, um, and I just I, I feel like the work that they are doing there, based on the legacy of Peter Drucker, is incredibly important at this time and in in, um, in our economic times. Um, Marianne Alavi, uh, Alavi um, from Emory. Um, business school and Emory Management School. So um, she'll be joining us as well as Mohan Reddy from our own uh, management school here at Weatherhead School of Management. I'm really looking forward to that one again because I have a special um, belief that there's just uh, that, that management education needs to own its influence. And once it does, it needs to begin to say, you know, here are the millions of people coming out of our management schools, making billions of decisions and billions of design opportunities. So I think um, that's going to be a very special panel as well. And then this evening, um, a reception and, um, and a session with Janine Benyus, the author of Biomimicry. Um, many people know her work, and she's developing a biomimicry guild right here in Ohio. Um, and we'll be having that reception um, in the Frank Gehry building um, the, at the Weatherhead School of Management. So just it, it's just a, I hope you enjoy coming into the building. It's, for me, I pinch myself every day when I come to work in a piece of artwork 
like that, you know. I actually, there's a parking lot that um, has the best, if you go to the fourth floor of the parking lot, it's the best view of the Frank Gehry building. Even when there's no, even when there's empty spaces down below, I always go to the fourth floor of that parking lot just so it makes me smile every morning. Anyway, um, so we have a great day today and um, let me uh, have Jean with, share a few announcements. Good morning. All right, so first off, um, I hope you all had a very enjoyable evening last night at the museum, and thank you to everybody that made that possible, and just once again, thank you to Nancy Adler for, for the design of that evening. Thanks. <laughs> and as David has mentioned, tonight's uh, evening reception will be in the Peter B. Lewis building. Again, it's within walking distance from here, so if it's nice out and it looks like it just might be today, we encourage you to take a walk over to the building and stretch your legs after a long day at the conference. Um, if you don't wish to do that, there will be a bus that will transport that you at 5.30 to, to the building. The reception starts at 6, and Janine Bennis will be speaking at 6.30. And after the reception, there will be buses going back to the Hyatt again, um, starting at 8.30 and, and ending at around 10 p.m. Um, now, something that I want to bring your attention to, and um, it's something that Ron mentioned before, we have uh, Diana Arsenian here, who is our graphic facilitator. And um, she is telling the story of the conference um, through, through her work here, and it is displayed in like a storyboard of what we're experiencing here today along the, the side of the wall right there. And what we will be doing is we'll be capturing those initially just by normal digital camera and uploading the photos onto our virtual forum where you can, you can go look at them and kind of recap what, what you're experiencing here at the conference. At the same time, we will be having them professionally digitally scanned after the forum, and then more high resolution images will be available on our virtual forum for you to go look at and to use and be an inspiration for your work post forum. The virtual forum also has a lot more that's happening there. There are webcasted uh, panel discussions and keynote speeches. There are hundreds of papers that have been submitted to the forum that are uploaded there that you can go study, most innovative research and uh, workshop proposals and, and new innovations and ideas. So I encourage you to go visit the virtual forum. Um, it's online at www dot globalforum2009.com and there's space there for you to discuss and interact with people that are at the forum and people that are also joining us virtually on the forum. So we encourage you to go look at it. The virtual forum stations are at the back there. The homepage is the global forum site. When you have time throughout the day or when you go back home after the forum, please go visit and please contribute your ideas there. This will also be the space for, for post-forum work and interaction. Um, another reminder that um, please be mindful of where you put your waste. Uh, we have the composting stations, we have recycling bins, and we have space for you to recycle paper and, and other materials. We want to keep this conference as waste-free as we can. Uh, all of the cups and knives and forks and napkins that you have are corn-based, soy-based products, and they can go into the composting bins together with your food waste. So, and, and that way we're just making sure that we have as little of an environmental footprint as we can through the Global Forum. And um, then without further ado, I have the honor and the pleasure of uh, introducing our moderator for the forum today and um, for, for the panel that's starting today. And um, I just, I have one more announcement that I need to make and I was just reminded by this lady right over here about that. Um, there will be a group meeting at lunchtime here, right here at table one. It is a group looking at schools and youth as an agent of community and world benefit. So if people that are interested in the role of youth and the role of schools um, can meet here with the group at table one at lunchtime. So, all right. So, the moderator for our panel this morning is uh, Professor Richard Buchanan. Now, Richard Buchanan is Professor of Design and Information Systems at the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University. 
And Richard joins Weatherhead from Carnegie Mellon, where he was the head of design and a professor of design. He was the head of the design school. And right here at Weatherhead, Richard is working on creating a framework for responsible action by integrating the disciplines of decision making that you find in management science and the design methods that look at more creative action. He's a firm believer that design needs to move to a more elevated role. And he's involved in the application of, of the methods of design in all aspects of the organization. He has been a speaker at many prestigious events and and spaces, and he is involved in projects that extend the application of design practice and theory into innovative new fields like organizational design and interaction design. And in that aspect, he has been involved in, in various large projects, and one of the most uh, intense and extensive ones was the redesign of the US Postal Service and redesigning all their products and the way that they're presented and communicated and the way people interact with them. And it's a massive, massive project that lasted three years and involved over 60 designers. We are very proud to have Richard with us and we're very happy that he'll be leading this discussion today on how design can be a catalyst for, for positive change and for creating world benefit. So please join me in welcoming Richard Buchanan to the Global Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. I lost my panel. Oh, you managed to come in. Good morning. My name is Dick Buchanan, and I'm very pleased to be here to moderate what I think will be a very exciting panel discussion. We have an excellent panel, and uh, uh, David has already given a brief introduction. I'm not going to stand on formality, because we've got work to do today. But you know the qualities of these individuals, and you will see in their presentations the kind of thinking that they're engaged in. The theme of this panel is design as a catalyst for massive change. If you follow the structure of the meeting, yesterday's meeting was about sustainability, the notions of appreciative inquiry, the notion of a goal, a purpose. We discuss problems and goals. Today, as David, I think, understands very well, we're moving toward action and the methods and tools for action in the context of appreciative inquiry. The global forum leads to action. And design is the tool that we have in mind to accomplish these goals. Understanding design is a key matter for us. We used the term yesterday in a rather flexible way, but today we need to bring it a little more to ground for action. Uh, some of the sessions will in fact involve work among us doing design work. So we're gonna begin this way, and, and I'll tell you right now that I've ended my role as moderator, uh, well, sort of, but David asked me to also be a panelist, and so I'm gonna give a few comments of my own if you don't mind. Uh, we are, I should point out though, going to ask you for questions from the audience. So there will be microphones around, and if there aren't, I'll, I'll, I'll shout to you. But we'll like questions by the end. We're not gonna have the same kind of panel that we had yesterday with our corporate speakers. This is more of an interactive and an engaged group. Our presentations are to present ideas to be considered. And here are my ideas, I have three. When I look at design, I need three things to understand design. I need to know what the subject matter is. Is there something that distinguishes the application of design from nuclear physics and chemistry and other matters? So I need to know the subject matter. Second, I need to know how the discipline or the art or the practice, how it works. What kind of methods and ways of working are characteristic of design? And third, I need to have some sense as a designer about what a goal means. What goals are we working toward? So subject matter. Methods and goals. With regard to subject matter, it's very important to understand the development of design over the course of the 20th century. To characterize this, I have a concept I call the four orders of design. They represent the different kinds of design problems that designers have focused on. And I'll tell you right now, at the beginning of the 20th century, the central problems were mass communication and mass production. And by God, the disciplines that evolved were graphic design and industrial design, a concern for signs and symbols in communication, and a concern for artifacts. 
If you look at your program, this is an excellent example of graphic design. Our folks from CIA did, a, a, I thought, a brilliant piece of work. This is what graphic design is about, providing information in organized ways, communicating effectively, the maps, diagrams. That's first order design. The artifacts, the chairs you're sitting in, the podium, our chairs here, uh, these are the physical artifacts. This is second order design. But by the 1950s, we were already starting to say, maybe we don't design just communication and not simply artifacts, but maybe we design actions. And we use the word interaction because we're concerned of how people interact with the things around them. Now, yes, in interaction, we need communication and symbols. We need artifacts. Gosh, how can we be communicating here without the lighting systems and the tables, the microphones? But the interaction itself is the focus. So how do we interact with computers? And then getting off of flatland, how do we interact with each other? A recent question that you should keep in your minds is what is service design? Designing services is designing interactions among people. This is the third order of design, a great new field of design practice. I spent a lot of time at Carnegie Mellon developing graduate programs in interaction design, and we had some of the first in the world because our focus was on people, how people relate together. But I reached a point where I had to understand that designing individual interactions was not enough, that we need to begin designing the environments within which many interactions take place. So my great concern is how do we design environments and organizations? This to me is fourth order design. And by golly, David, that's what I think appreciative inquiry is all about. How do you mobilize and bring together a group of people working together, not in top down, not bottom up, but with each other, interacting well and creatively to solve problems? Notice the massive change notion here. In the evolution of design, the problems have become progressively more expansive and threatening. Frankly, the idea of designing cultural environments is frightening to me, it's dangerous. There are many things about design that are dangerous. But the truth is, unless we can find a way to design the organizations and environments within which our interactions occur, we are at a drift in a world of trouble. So that's the subject matter to me, in human interactions individually and collectively. That's the focus of new design in the massive change co context. Design is a catalyst because it knows how to study that. What are some of the concepts? Well, yesterday's presentation had a number of really interesting and cool ideas, I think, right at the heart of design. I would just point out a couple of features that maybe didn't surface as clearly. One is this. You cannot have design if you do not have a product. Design is about making a product. Now, the product doesn't have to be an artifact. It can be a service, a relationship an experience, but there is some result to design thinking, and the discipline of understanding what it is we make, that's part of the practice of design. We discover that in the process of making, but design is not just about thinking, it's about doing and making. I'm more a, uh, a follower of John Dewey in this respect, my, my great teacher was a student of John Dewey, and I'm in the great chain of being in the American pragmatist, pragmatist's philosophy. So I'm interested in thinking, doing, and feeling. Design is not just about thinking, it's about doing things effectively and making effective products. Product is a core concept, but so with that is the notion of prototyping. The idea that we make a product in a model form, we test it with other people and see what went wrong. One of the biggest projects I was involved in was the redesign of the Australian taxation system. I don't mean the tax forms, that's graphic design. We were designing the system of taxation. Excise, income, uh, all the forms. I found in working with people at the, what they call the White House, which is the old parliament building, that they had very little notion of, of product in their lives. They thought that taxation was like a chemical engineering process. You went out, sunk a well, sucked up money, brought it back to Canberra. Through crack distillations, you distribute it to the population. 
not the way it works. They didn't focus on people, but getting them to understand the concept of product and the people they serve, then the notion that they don't have to be perfect the first time. That in fact, the reason we prototype in design is to find out what goes wrong. Everybody screws up. Principle number one, we all make mistakes. Design is powerful because it recovers from mistakes. We do that through a, a deliberate process of prototyping and user investigation. I thought that our uh, colleague from uh, Procter & Gamble, P&G, yesterday was wonderful. I thought his concept of invention was right at the heart, and I decided not to talk about that today because he did such a great job. I will say this, though, that we live in a world of interpretations, interpretations given to us in school, in institutions, everywhere things are interpreted for us. They're interpreted based on categorical meanings, meanings that f are fixed. Design is precisely about changing the meanings that we accept. It's a transformation of what is an interpretation that we think we understand to new possibility. That is a tremendous intellectual leap. The notion of moving from the categories of our experience to the places of new ideas, design is about that. So product, prototyping, and new ideas. The final comment I'd like to make just to draw this together, we have subject matter. We have some idea of how we work as designers. The third is how does a designer think about a goal? And I'd like to add this cautionary point to us. Yesterday we discussed sustainability extensively. We discussed it in the natural world. We began cautiously to talk about it in the human world. I find sustainability to be a very dangerous concept, a concept we must be very cautious in using. Because the deeper question, sustainability is not the value to me. The deeper question is, what do we sustain? Designers are intent on looking at that matter. Now let's be honest, designers have been incredible collaborators in the destruction of the planet. For 150 to 200 years, they have built the products that are the danger to us. And there's no way to escape that moral responsibility. But understand that the goals we set are collective goals. And as a people, we're coming to understand new goals, new purposes. And designers are more than ready to engage in that. I'd suggest to you that not sustainability alone, but human dignity is a goal worth considering in design. The quality of information presentation speaks to the way we treat other people, the dignity of other people. The quality of a service, so many of our services are terrible in the world. No respect and no dignity given to human beings. Organizational process, dignity taken away. I'd suggest to you that the goal of our making and our action is to sustain and support human dignity in all of its forms. That is an inquiry, and exactly what David is concerned with, an appreciative inquiry, that we find the positive features of human dignity, the positive qualities, and build toward those. So subject matter, nature of design, the goal. I've done my piece, I think. I'd like to, uh, to ask Peter Coughlin to come forward. Peter is a wonderful designer and works with IDEO. He's a lead in the transformation group. Peter, please. Excellent, good. I guess I'll sit here. Good morning. <clears throat> Bring some air here. If, if someone could get some water. I, I'm already feeling, feeling it going here. Um, so I thought I would, I, would, uh, I would talk a little bit about why I'm optimistic about the role of design in, um, in catalyzing massive innovation and change. And, um, but I'm a little bit humbled. You know, Dick kind of pointed out that I'm one of the folks that's responsible for really screwing up the planet in the sense that I've been, I've been uh, before I worked with IDEO, a, a design consultancy, I worked for Nissan designing cars. And, I mean, you, you can't get much worse than that. I, and anyway, we'll, we'll get beyond that. Um, I want to I, I talk a, a little bit about why I'm optimistic about design, though. I think that actually we're poised, to, we're in a really interesting place as designers. Thank you, David. We're in a really interesting place as designers. 
and, and I think that the, the whole field is evolving. Now, I work for a design consultancy, which is actually a really great place to sense change that's happening in the world because clients come to us all the time with new and different problems, and we have to always say, yes, we can solve that, whether we figured out how or not, and then we have to configure ourselves very quickly to do that. And the types of problems that our clients have been coming to uh, us with recently has been changing so quickly that we as an organization, I feel, have even failed to evolve quickly enough to meet some of those challenges. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing uh, to evolve and, and, and how that plays into the, um, into the topic at hand. Um, so the first, the first thing I'll, 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 I'll speak about is that um, I, I, I coined a phrase that the, the I in design is getting smaller. And this is a really exciting thing for me because when I came into the field of design, I wasn't actually a designer, I'm trained as a linguist. And I saw, I saw these really great designers who, you know, they, they wore all the right clothing, they, they had products that they could point to that were iconic and beautiful, and I had nothing. Um, except I, I understood the process of design very deeply. But as I started engaging with designers and seeing what, what is the value that they're bringing to the table, it's really about their thinking, not about the things that they produce. Over time, what's happened is that, um, that some of the designers that uh, have grown up through the firm have started to say, you know, I'm starting to be interested in, in this notion of egoless design. How can I take my ego out of design because the problems that are coming to us don't have room for my ego anymore? And that's a really interesting and, and hopeful comment that a number of my um, design colleagues have made. Um, a really, another interesting thing that's happening in this, in this notion of um, the, the, uh, the eye and design getting smaller is that a number of our solutions are coming from our clients. So it's no longer about you bring your problem to the design house, we solve the problem and give it back to you. No, what's happening is designers are playing a fundamentally different role. They're actually enabling the clients to come up with their own solutions. The, uh, another uh, idea related to this is that um, is that everyone is a designer. Um, how many of you have been called a designer in the last couple of days? Or maybe, yeah. Um, I, I was amused, I, I, I was at the airport yesterday and I got a, a pamphlet from, from, um, from United telling me that I was a designer and they had a picture of someone actually painting a plane and, and then I could choose all these different services that I want and I thought, okay, that's pretty interesting a little scary if they're gonna have me painting the plane, but at any rate, um, anyone can be a designer. And, um, and the other interesting thing about this, the, the, the eye in design getting smaller is that we actually need far more people than just designers to solve the problems that are coming our way. A second reason that I'm really hopeful about design in, um, in catalyzing massive change is that um, design methods have become public property. When I started at IDEO 12 years ago, um, our, pro our process, everything that we put out had a copyright on it. And about five years ago, we said, wait a minute, this really isn't working. Um, it's, it, it feels too possessive. And so we started just giving our process away. And, and of course, now everyone's giving the process away. You can go get process guides at um, Stanford. I'm sure Case is publishing things. Everyone, everyone's saying, here, have the tools. This is, a, this is really exciting because um, in, in what we were most feared that, that people would take over um, our work from us is actually the, quite the opposite. People are improving our process. Some of the biggest process improvements that I've encountered have actually been, have come from clients saying, hey, why don't we do it this way? So this letting go has actually um, made the design process a stronger one. Um, an another, uh, another point on that topic, uh, David Kelly, our founder, has stated that his goal, and I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit here, but it's basically to bring out the inner designer in everyone in the world. And, and that's a really interesting statement coming from a, um, the head of a design school because there, where's the, there's no more line between the students that we're training to go out in the world and the rest of the world. Uh, the third, the third uh, reason that I'm optimistic has to do with the fact that the, I, I believe the object of design is, is changing. 
And um, a, a little bit parallel to what, what you were saying about the, your, your four areas of design, I, I think of it in, in three, um, sort of three stages. The first stage being um, design for production. So design was all about creating, figuring out how to create things that are, and for mass market, for distribution. And then there was, after we saturated the market, um, how, how do we get people to consume? So design for consumption. How can we actually increase the rate of consumption? But what's happening now is that as the market gets saturated with all that, we're entering this new era, um, the, which is the, um, the era of design for participation. And that's a really interesting and promising area. Um, it, not the least because most of the things that are being designed for participation are actually not very well designed. How many of you are um, Facebook fans? Yeah, not, not so many, and one of the reasons is that if you ever go to Facebook, you can't even really figure out what it is, right? It's just so poorly designed as an interface. How many of you have Twitter um, going on your phones or whatever? Yeah, again, it's like I spent two hours just trying to figure out what it was when I signed up, right? So, but these are tools that actually are going to um, enable massive change, and they already are, and they're, they're not designed very well. So that's a really interesting, an interesting um, uh, a conflict we got going there. And of course, um, you know, th these large-scale challenges that are coming to us are going to require all of us to be designing and all of us to be doing it in um, very sort of light-touch ways that, um, that have lots of reach. The fourth reason that I'm optimistic that design can help um, in this era of massive change is that um, there's now a belief in the world that any kind of challenge can be solved by design. And that didn't used to be the case. I think people believe that design was for objects, design was for making things aesthetically beautiful, but the kinds of challenges, as I mentioned earlier, that our clients are bringing to us are uh, uh, a recent challenge. How do we help the, um, the shrinking watershed in India? Well, that's a really interesting design challenge. What are we going to do about that? Um, how can we help people quit smoking? Another interesting design challenge that's really not about an object. So, so those are the four reasons that I'm really optimistic that design can um, play a pretty strong role in, in um, helping in this, in this critical uh, point in our evolution. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I thought, thought that was an excellent presentation. I really like the ideas you brought forward. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Jason Pearson. He's CEO of Green Blue, and you'll find him to be an unusual speaker as well with a different point of view in this. I'm looking forward to your metrics. Come on, Jason. Thank you. I hope I do prove to be an unusual speaker. Uh, I did prepare a quite structured presentation. I'm going to contribute three concepts that I hope will contribute to the conversation this morning and the conversation today. And in the interest of sticking within my time limits and giving us time for conversation, I'll read quite a portion of the presentation just to make sure that we have the concepts on the table for then a more open conversation. So, and I'm not sure how I advance the slides. Do, do I just say advance? So, Three concepts. The first is the concept of catalytic events. One of the key lessons of systems thinking is that small catalytic events can cause large changes in complex systems. Small catalytic events can cause large changes in complex systems. I can best illustrate the idea of catalytic events with a design parable, which is also a parable, I think, of the modern industrial economy. In the mid-19th century, Etienne Leopold Trouvelot was interested in, in a design problem facing the American silk industry. We heard from Gunter Pauli that we today have opportunities in the silk industry. In the mid-19th mid century, we were facing challenges in that industry. Silk-producing moths were being killed off by disease, and Trouvelot decided, creatively, to experiment with crossbreeding silk-producing moths with a disease-resistant moth from Europe an interesting design approach. So he Im imported a cluster of gypsy moth eggs. Unfortunately, some of the larvae escaped. And this turned out to be a catalytic event for the forest systems of the American Northeast. 
The moths were imported in 1868, and by 1900, 30 years later, they had spread to the forest around Boston. By now, they have reached the northern peninsula of Michigan and deep into Virginia with no end in sight. And since 1980, gypsy moths have defoliated over one million acres of forest each year. Now, Trouvelo did not intend this devastation. He just wanted to solve a design problem to improve silk production. But his actions had a hugely negative catalytic effect in spite of his use of the lofty techniques of biomimicry. Some would say he should have known better, but the fact is he didn't. So how do we learn to know better? To answer that question of how we learn to know better, I turn to the work of the engineering historian Henry Petrosky and what he tells us about the role of humility in design and innovation. Petrosky has made a career of demonstrating the vital role of failure in successful design achievement. His basic message is that we fail our way to success and we do it through a process of prototyping. While we may be able to imagine what we want to achieve, that goal in the upper right hand corner of the slide, improved silk production for instance, a sustainable world, we don't really know how to get there. So, using the best available information, we experiment, we prototype. If our prototype is successful and moves us toward our goal, we build upon it. If not, we discard it and try again. In other words, innovation is an iterative, experimental process. We prototype, we get feedback, we analyze the prototype, we, prototype, we, we analyze that feedback and we prototype again. Failure is feedback and we fail our way to success. At Green Blue, we think about the modern industrial economy as a network of prototypes. We have prototyped a set of global systems, economic, political, industrial, transportation, energy systems, all of which are prototypes for improving our collective quality of life. Even our system of democratic government, as Jefferson acknowledged, is an experiment, a prototype. And Churchill perhaps said it best when he suggested that democracy is actually the worst form of government, except for all those others that we've tried. We might say the same for free market capitalism. In every area of the modern industrial world, we are living out experiments, prototypes for a better future. And in many ways, these prototypes have been successful in improving our quality of life, but they have also given us negative feedback. Some has been social, labor unrest, protest movements, income inequities. Some has been economic, market failures, corporate bailouts, trade wars. And some has been environmental, biodiversity and habitat loss, climate change, ocean pollution. So our collective analysis as a society of this feedback has produced a simple but rather disturbing conclusion, particular as Peter, particularly as Peter suggested for those of us who think of ourselves as the designers of this system. We are becoming victims of the unintended consequences of our own designs. Put more simply, we are soiling our own nest. So the question is, how can we prototype sustainable systems? At Green Blue, my organization, we ask with humility and with a sensitivity to the possibility of both intended and unintended catalytic effects, how can we focus this question? We ask, how can we prototype sustainable systems in specific industry sectors? And I'm going to give you a little insight into how we think about this, and this is kind of part of the story of how we think about humility as a contribution to our conversation. We think in terms of industrial supply chains as systems, and we look for moments in these supply chains when decisions may be occurring that could result in significant systemic catalytic effects. As a result, we focus primarily on the production phases of industrial supply chains for two reasons. First, when a decision is made in the production phase, it will likely result in the industrial reproduction of thousands or even millions of units. So a single decision has a huge multiplier effect downstream. And second, when a decision is made in the production phase, it often requires significant capital investment for manufacturing equipment and other infrastructure. Until that capital investment is depreciated, the decision and its impacts will not change. So production phase decisions have a huge potential to generate systemic catalytic effects over a long period of time. We at Green Blue try to influence those decisions to ensure that these catalytic effects are positive to the extent possible. In doing this work, we're constantly trying to understand the best way to achieve positive systemic change. And in 2006, we published a report called Design and Sustainability, Opportunities for Systemic Transformation, in which we described four approaches, four strategies, by which we could understand our own and others' efforts to prototype systemic transformation. And this report is free. It's available for download on our website. And David Cooper Ryder asked me to 
just talk a little bit about the content of that report, so that'll be the final piece of this presentation. I'm gonna close my remarks with just describing, I think, the four strategies and giving a quick example of each, and this is just a contribution to our thinking of how you can categorize some of the approaches to making systemic change through design. First, integrative strategies. Integrative projects take on the ambitious challenge of trying to coordinate all the moving parts of a system all at once. Perhaps the best metaphor for integrative projects would be permaculture, an approach to land use and especially food production that seeks to achieve viable, permanent agriculture through the harmonious integration of human communities, microclimate, animals, annual and perennial plants, soils, and water. And as an example of like how we apply this in our work, and this is breaking the rule of my own humility by talking about our own work as an example, but our Sustainable Packaging Coalition brings together 200 companies, quite large companies, to collaborate along the entire supply chain of packaging from raw material extraction through end of life to promote and implement a sustainable future for packaging and packaging systems, trying to get at the whole system at once. Second, key ingredient projects make discrete interventions that allow existing systems to utilize their inherent potential. Maybe the best metaphor for key ingredient projects are enzymes, which are natural catalysts, reducing the amount of energy or time required for the chemical reactions that sustain, li sustain life. And as an example, I'd maybe forward um, the microcredit approach pioneered by Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank. Just by the simple innovation of providing small loans to the poor, Grameen Bank achieves higher incomes and a host of quality of life improvements that were unattainable using conventional development strategies, but utilizing the existing components of the existing system. Third, alignment projects redirect systems' inherent potential by devising effective means of realigning incentives with desired outcomes. Perhaps the best metaphor for alignment project is the martial art of Aikido, whose practitioners seek to use an opponent's own energy to their own purposes. And as an example, I'd give the US EPA's sodium dioxide cap and trade acid rain program, which is now a model for carbon cap and, cap and trade approaches. A great example of cre creating alignment between the private sector innovation capacity and the interests of the public. And a 2003 OMB study found that the acid rain program accounted for the largest quantified human health benefits, over $70 billion annually, of any major fed federal regulatory program implemented in the previous 10 years, with benefits exceeding costs by a ratio of 40 to 1. That's alignment. Finally, framework projects create the ideal conditions which others can devise and implement solutions more effectively or efficiently. And I like to think of framework project as similar to artificial reefs, which are the solid structures that conservation marine biologists create as a host for the or oysters, corals, and other invertebrates, thereby providing a ready-made foundation for the development of a flourishing ecosystem of marine life. And as an example, I cite our project Clean Ingredients, which is a partnership with the US EPA Design for the Environment program, which is an online database of ingredient product chemicals that allows chemical supply companies to list their ingredients profiled according to human and environmental health and allows chemical formulators, people who make cleaning products, to identify chemicals for use. I'd like to think of it, therefore, as us creating the landscape, the artificial reef on which green chemistry innovation can flourish. So to wrap this up, my goal was to introduce some concepts that could be reference points. I started with the parable of Trouvelot's catalytic effects and the question, how can we learn to know better? I then talked about the humility that we should bring to the process of prototyping solutions and the recognition that every solution, no matter how large and pervasive, is still a prototype. And then finally, I talked about the type of strategies that we have seen as effective, and I look forward to exploring in this conversation and in future conversations here other strategies for achieving positive systemic transformation through design. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. That was, that was an excellent presentation. Our next speaker is Jennifer McNulfi from another design company, uh, Herman Miller, well known in, in our field as designers, and probably to you too. Jennifer? Thank you. I think we have some slides. I also have some slides to share with, the, with you. Great. Hello, my name is Jennifer McNulfi, and I'm here to try to share with you briefly, or as briefly as possible, um, how design and a strong commitment to sustainability has led us to growth and innovation. It has inspired us in the past and continues to inspire us as we look at the future. Describing the culture of design at Herman Miller is actually no small task, and to a certain degree, I think it's quite a mystery for all of us. 
uh, in the 70s, Charles Eames, who was a designer uh, who worked with Herman Miller for several years, used to say that design is largely the management of constraints. And um, for us, it certainly is about problem solving. But one thing that has brought me to Herman Miller and continues to inspire my work um, is a deep understanding of design coupled with a deep understanding of technology and technology innovation. When those two constraints are together, we are able to actually create things that matter and uh, processes and systems and solutions that matter, specifically for the focus of designing and building a better world around our customers. I'm not sure if uh, we do have a video. I will certainly want to show this video, but um, I want to share a small anecdote with you, uh, which uh, I guess we'll be able to play. It reminds me of yesterday's presentation. Go ahead, you may play that. In 1995, Herman Miller opened the Greenhouse, our environmentally friendly manufacturing and office facility in Holland, Michigan. But we weren't the only ones to move in. Large colonies of angry paper wasps decided to make the exterior of our building their new home as well. We could have reached for the pesticides. Instead, we invited in yet another group, bees. 600,000 of them, housed in 12 beehives on the greenhouse grounds. Before long, the bees persuaded the wasps to move elsewhere. Our new friends cross-pollinated the surrounding fields, giving us spectacular wildflowers. And honey, lots of it. So we began bottling the honey as gifts for our guests. And while not many companies have managed to capture their corporate philosophy in a four ounce bottle, we believe the story behind our honey speaks volumes. I share this anecdote because I was reminded yesterday from Bill of the greenhouse, and, and I have to say I've never seen anyone wear Hawaiian shirts in the plant as many times as I've been there. But why did I share this with you? It's, it's a small video, and it's an anecdote in many ways. It's a story. Um, we are not in the business of selling honey, and we're not in the business of designing honey bottles. However, this was an opportunity, and it was um, a, a place of applying, like many others, in the way that we design products and environments, design thinking, um, and um, innovative, creative thinking that led us to unexpected, um, surprising solutions. In this case, one of the non-negotiable constraints for Herman Miller is uh, respect for the environment and sustainability. So I'm going to show you some examples of what we call design into action. Design technology and absolutely non-negotiable constraints for sustainability to create new products. The history is long, as you know. You probably recognize this chair. This is the plywood molded chair in 1946, Charles and Ray Eames cut together with Herman Miller. And um, they were exploring uh, pressure molded plywood, which was a production innovation uh, and technology that was not available at the time. And uh, this is what it led. It led to a new form that actually catalyzed many of the production um, of uh, modern design uh, chairs. You may recognize this one as well. This led to the Eames Lounge. This was 1956. And very quickly, um, we proceed decades. Here again, uh, the Aaron chair. This is designed by Don Chadwick and the late Bill Stumpf in 1994. By many of these chairs, recognized as a dot-com era chair. Um, it is certainly at the time incorporated more patentable techniques and ideas than any other Herman Miller research program of its time. It's a breakthrough ergonomic design seating, and um, it was made largely by design materials, so by recycled materials, so in a way it was good for the user, for the body, uh, for health, as well as for the environment. But what's interesting to me about this chair, um, as many not know, it was, it was one of those, yet again, leaps of faith and trusting a design intuition and very much trusting a designer for something that was not seen as, as um, a, a possible, viable. The market will reject it. This is a new form that is obscure and it won't be accepted. Uh, but the reality was that this became the design of the decade, or at least it was awarded as such. And uh, this idea and this commitment to design and sustainability, and particularly to an understanding of technology, continues still today. And what I'm showing you here very quickly is the Embody Chair, which was designed by Bill Stump and Jeff Weber in 2008. 
this this chair is quite compelling, uh, particularly for for the work that I do. But in general, it is a chair that was designed very much so in observance of how technology has affected the lives of our customers. Specifically, this chair is designed for bloggers, for people that spend a lot of time in front of the computer, in front of a laptop. And they really. It is about studying, as you were saying before, Dick, the interaction between people and their tools, people and their technologies, that we are able to create new forms, new compelling forms that don't make sense unless you really understand what the problem they're trying to solve and the job that is trying to get done. In this case, um, this chair um, has a spine that was designed to mimic the human spine, and it has a pioneering pixelation technology that completely molds to your body as you move. Um, what's interesting as well is that this chair was designed with 100% uh, re renewable energy, 42% recycled material, and when it completes its life cycle, 95% of the chair components are actually recyclable. So we apply at Herman Miller um, something that we called uh, our DFE protocol is designed for the environment. It's an extremely stringent protocol that everything we do needs to be reflective and respective of the environment. We just met 27% last year, and now 50% of all of our sales uh, for the goal of 2010 need to be DFE products, um, or at least DFE compliant. So again, to close, I don't know how much time we'll have, but I, um, I, I wanted to share some voices of some designers. But if we don't have enough time for that, I definitely just want to share with you how this process has um, been part of Herman Miller culture for quite, um, quite a long time, several decades, in fact. Um, as I said, Eames used to say that design is largely the management of constraints. And um, as we look to the 21st century, there are certain constraints that are new, that were not even um, existing a few decades ago, or not even thought of as important. So Dino Dini, a game developer, some of the designers that I like to look at, um, actually elaborates on that, that design is the management of constraints, but the choice of which constraints are non-negotiable is crucial. And in the design process, as we look at the 21st century, I agree with both of uh, my colleagues that preceded us, um, interaction with technology as well as a user participation in the design is um, a non-negotiable constraint as well as sustainability as we think of the environments of the future. So every so often in our history, Herman Miller has chosen to uh, confront, tackle, if you will, design and take action on problems that were radically changing the lives of our customers. In my analysis, generally speaking, they had to deal with the way technology, innovation in technology, be it communication or te building technology or design technology, was making possible new opportunities. In 1930, we introduced modern design. Herman Miller started as a home um, uh, office, or a home uh, design um, uh, company. In 1968, we launched Action Office by all recognized as systems furniture and therefore generating an entirely new industry. And ergonomic seating was introduced with the ergon chair in 1976. The idea of designing for the body and designing ergonomically as a, as a principle of design was not really even existing until then. Now we'll be speaking later today about programmable environments. It's um, a new uh, advanced innovation initiative at Herman Miller, which we believe will um, catalyze some of what we, we think are disruptive innovations in our industry, uh, and in some cases generating new industries altogether. Um, so this is how ideas have come to be at Herman Miller. And as I said, um, I, I don't know if we, we do have time, it doesn't sound like we do, but Herman Miller, um, some of you may not know this, but we do not have designers in-house. Uh, part of our culture and very much part of the challenge that we want to continue to pursue is to continue to be inspired by designers and thinkers, scholars, technologists that are external to the company. Not only this keeps us fresh, but it is about establishing a dialogue with the practitioners whose, whose very job and whose very intuition and essence is to capture the moment of an era, the moment of a time. Um, personally, um, I think that when we talk about design, there's three things that I can leave you with from my own personal experience, not only, as I said, the introduction of design and technology to generate new form, but we talk about the inevitability of design, meaning the solution is almost inherent in the design problem. And when the question is asked, the design process is just a matter of revealing that solution. And we also talk about the silence of design. 
Design isn't necessarily something that uh, can only reside in museums. Certainly, we strive to create compelling new forms, and some of them have resulted in iconic objects that do reside in museums. But the point for us is that design is a fundamental part of our lives and is a fundamental part of improving the environment and the world around us. When design is successful, it in fact becomes silent. It's in the background. You adopt it and becomes part of your life, very much so as some of our most successful technologies. We can't even think about our lives without them. And the last thing that I would leave in challenge, especially for those of you who are educators, is um, to trust design intuition. There is something deep within the human spirit and deep within um, certainly uh, design training or, or part of what it takes to uh, explore a design sensibility that um, sometimes can just be described as a deep intuition uh, that leads you to do the things that are right. And those, as I was saying uh, before, we call them things that matter. Um, with that has come a very humbling uh, relationship and a very uh, challenging as well as a stimulating and inspiring a way of tackling design with our designers. And um, the fact that we have to trust their intuition, very much so, um, from our executive leaderships, through operations, through marketing, through all the way down uh, to any aspect of the building, of the, of the company in, in its minute details. Yes, I will leave you with that. We don't have time to share the design voices, but those are some things that I'd like to talk. Thank you very much. I don't, I don't know about you, but I expect that Herman Miller will find a way so that when we sit in a chair, it will contribute to the power grid. You will talk about that later. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a proprietary secret. Our next speaker is Kenneth Gergen. He is not from Warthmore, he is from Swarthmore and he is president of the Taos Institute. And I think you'll find his comments on social construction interesting and his insights into design as a catalyst, a very powerful part of our conversation. Kenneth? Well, I thank you for inviting me. Um, I feel a little bit out of water because there aren't so many scholars here and those who are must, be, must feel like I do, a bit humble because the kinds of uh, initiatives that uh, Jason and Jennifer have talked about, for example, and are illustrated in all those cases out in the hall, they're enormously impressive. Uh, actions in the world which are actually accomplishing something uh, outside of words on paper which seem to be only taking our forests down the hill. So what can I offer? I mean, I come here with great humility. What can I say? <laughs> Well, uh, all right, I had to work through this yesterday, and I, there were two issues that came up for me in terms of uh, a number of the discussions yesterday. One of them came out of a comment, I think it was Ronaldo Brutico, who said, uh, ideas precede action. And that's an interesting issue when you ask yourself, well, where do the ideas come from? What precedes the ideas? Because if we get to, we're going to get to action, Ideas are only a media, mediation point. Where do they come from? Secondly, why should there, I asked myself yesterday, why should there be any relationship necessarily between design on the one hand and sustainability on the other? Is there any connection? I mean, we could have design working, designers working on new bombs or um, uh, new automobiles that ne didn't necessarily, weren't necessarily fuel efficient. It's possible design can be used for any end. Why then should we care about sustainability? Okay, these are the issues I kind of want to talk about. Now look, a lot of my time I spend with, some, with a group called the Taos, T-A-O-S uh, Institute. And we at the Taos Institute share a group of ideas we call social construction. Now, that's a fairly formal word for what is, I think, a, basically a very simple but provocative idea. And that is that everything that we take to be real, true, objective, rational, valuable, issues from relationship, not from individual minds, but from relationship. 
I mean, I take it to be a real fact in the world that I'm Kenneth Gergen. But where did that reality come from? Some kind of discussion, I take it, between my parents. A convention which they developed, which has been passed on through school systems and publications and so on, to the point that I can't deny that. But after all, at its root, it is the social process which has yielded me as this person, and which has also yielded me as a human being and as having anything we'll call intrinsic value. Because there is no intrinsic value until there's relationship. So there, where this will lead as you press those ideas forward is that we somehow have got to especially care not for individuals, but for the relational process out of which the very idea of an individual issues. Let me say a little bit more about what the kinds of things we talk about and the sorts of practices that we're involved with at the Taos Institute. It's, it's a, we value the convention of viewing ourselves as the I in design, um, the ego. I value the idea, or at least I used to, that somehow what I say is my idea. But after all, do I have any idea at all, anything to say of value at all until you give me that? In effect, I can talk away here. I can say a lot of words, but at least some of you won't be hearing this at all because you've got a lot of other things you're concerned with, not the least of which is a beautiful day out there and you're wondering why I should be inside all day. Some of you will find some things I say, and you should, objectionable because there are many other points of view. So when I say those things, I'm not saying anything that's good. I'm saying something that's actually negative. Some of you will take some phrase, some idea, and you'll do something with it because it fits into a project that you're working on. It will become yours. You'll say, yeah, I can use that. You don't take the whole thing. You take the piece you need for what you're doing. Then you have to ask, what is it I have said? What have I possibly said? Because you have brought me into saying you have co-created what it is I have to say. So I owe you my meaning. Yet on the other hand, what could you have said until I was saying anything? That is, you can't disagree with me until I've said anything. You can't raise your hand and say, I don't like that one until I've said anything. You can't take something and do, put it into a project of yours until I've said anything. So in fact, you need me to make those things happen. It's co-action, collaborative action, co-action out of which reality, value, morals, reason emerge. If I put out my hand and you shake it, I am now an acquaintance of yours. If I put out my hand and you suddenly twirl me in space, I become a dancer. If I put out my hand and you kneel before it and kiss it, uh, I become what, a king? If, you, if I put out my hand and you give me a manicure, I am your customer. But you don't have the last word in this because that supplement that you make to my action to give it meaning, to give me meaning, actually is itself an action and it stands now to be supplemented by me because it has no meaning until I confirm that it has some kind of meaning. So if I put up my hand and you, you, you uh, let's say you put out your hand and I disregard the hand as a handshake and I put it aside and embrace you, now I've taken a handshake and I've made it not of an acquaintance, it's not an acquaintance anymore, it's now a friendship. And presumably, and in principle, that practice of action supplement and is a continuous process so that 
The idea of friendship could change in the next conversation. The idea of acquaintance could change in the next conversation, and so on and so on. Because everything it said is in context. Meaning in that sense is never in somebody's head. It's always in the relationship. It's never inside. It's always between, and it's in constant motion in principle. Okay. Take those ideas for a minute. Now put it in the, in the context of thinking about creativity. Now, we live in a world of um, real chairs. A reality. Who can deny it? Well, yes, it's a real chair, but whose convention is that? Um, it seems solid enough, but if we go to a physicist and have him talk about whatever that is, it's not solid. It's not even a chair. There's no chair in physics. It looks to be gray, and who could deny that? We, a whole room would say, yeah, that looks gray to me. But in the world of psychology, there is no gray in the chair. It's uh, light reflected on the retina. Now, each of these cases are ones in which what we've done is to bring in another reality. We've unsettled the convention in some way. We brought in another supplement which unsettles our common agreements. Yeah, that's a chair and it's gray. It's that unsettling which is the, provides the basis of creativity. Try it this way. Now we have common ways, conventional ways of talking. Yeah, well that's a great chair and it's rather comfortable and it's rather laid back. And we can talk in those conventional ways and they're all comfortable, but if you wanna try, you know, try out creativity, think of another convention of talking. Try to talk about that chair poetically use the convention of poetry and suddenly all sorts of other things will happen they just will happen because that convention will simply take you into new spaces and i was just thinking there for if i had to write a a poem about that chair and I, this is crazy but uh, i was thinking okay what what all right well, i want to use metaphors i want to use uh, unsettled language i want to say something like uh Oh, mighty mashed potato, you uh, grim gray friend. <laughs> and all those words now begin to have other evocations, other implications, out of which it becomes something else. It also means, uh, and I, I, this um, I guess was uh, one of Jason's point, um, or maybe it was Peter's, I guess. Look, we have within us, yeah, with Peter's, inner designers in the sense that we come out of multiple relationships. So I have, in principle, many, many voices because I'm involved with many, many relationships. Most of the time, however, because we make reality locally, which seems real to us and conventional for us, those voices are gone. So whatever I'm saying now, I am hiding basically myriad people whom I can be. That inner designer is about linking yourself with those multiple voices, going back and asking, well, what else do I bring to the table? What else as a child, as a cleaning a, a person, as a, as a person who's interested in, uh, in uh, environments, what else, what other voices do I bring? Because each of those voices is indeed gonna disrupt the convention. It also means bringing other voices into the, it means bringing as many voices as possible because the more background which one can access in the design process, the greater the possibility for creative production and the greater the possibility for bringing in multiple values for a sustainable world, which I'll get to in a moment. So a process like appreciative inquiry is really quite wonderful in the sense it starts with the multiples starting to build on the multiples and finding the commons. But the multiples do get on the table, and there should be other design practices which enable that to happen, to multiply the possibilities. Why should we care? Why should design be interested in sustainability? 
One of the problems, and it's kind of, it's poignant in a way. One of our problems is reality. That is, in the sense of our agreements. That is, we live in comfortable worlds of the real and the true and the good. We kind of know what knowledge is, and we like to think that it's secure. And we live on that day to day. It nurtures us, and we get along with what we take to be the case. But taking something to be the case is also a closure. It's also a closure of the conversation. As soon as someone says something which is disjunctive, which you might say is creative, that we've got a problem. Where is that coming from? What right feel does that represent? How stupid, how immoral, how problematic. So by common agreements, we generate silos of meaning which are resistant to change, because we know. That's why I like the theme of humility was brought up, I think, by Jennifer. Humility. Those silos are, you might, in fact, say, responsible for most of the divisions in the world, most of the, what we'll call crime, terrorism, conf world conflagrations for genocide. and the destruction of the environment. Because those silos, as soon as we create a world of humans and nature, and that becomes a natural category, nature, as opposed to being humans, we've got a problem. We need a philosophy not of differences, but something like differentiation, where there is a continuum, where there are no clear boundaries between a thing and anything else, between me and you, you who give me meaning, We also, in this coactive process, it, it is myopic to think that it's just us together talking. Because that coactive process means also coaction with things like oxygen, foodstuffs, temperatures, and so on. That that dialogue that we're having is not just a dialogue among persons, it's a dialogue with nature. Nature brings us into meaning in the same way that you bring me into meaning. So if we're going to talk about collaborative processes of design, we're going to talk about networks, we're going to talk about dialogue, if we really take that seriously, it will include all that there is. So that design, if it's really true to that, to itself, will include all that there is that gives, gives design its potential, gives designers the possibility of even being designers. Because we're all in it together, and it just doesn't mean me and you. It means all. Thank you very much. When I agreed to moderate the panel, I, I had the, the typical fear of a moderator. Will there be coherence in this group? And I think there's a remarkable coherence in this group. I have a lot of regard for my colleagues here. Um, there are some themes that we seem to share. One is the role of participation in design today, the social context that you've spoken of and in fact has been across the, the board. But you may have seen other matters in our conversation. I wonder if there are any questions that you may have for the group. We have a few minutes, and I think it's important that we get some questions from folks. There is a controversial figure over there already. It's not my question. Ah. Uh, it's from uh, Nick Marsh. He's a theater kid from London. Can you ask Peter, can you ask Peter, what is IDEO's value add? Beyond smart people, if everyone is using similar methods to them, and charging less. It's a great question, and, and that has to be one of the challenges that we've seen. I think the, um, I think the value add is um, we have a lot of practice at what we do, and um, and that practice makes for a, a, a certain uh, belief and and fluency with the process, which can I think lead to um, better solutions faster. 
So, um, but you know, that the, the point is well taken that you know, the, the com the, our competitors right now are not other design firms, they're actually big networks of individuals. Uh, would anyone else care to comment on that? Uh, I think I'd like to comment a little bit just to say that I think that what we find in our work, we, interestingly, uh, as I was listening to Peter, I heard something similar to the work that we do. When we're working with a group of companies in the private sector, necessarily we, as a tiny nonprofit, we necessarily don't have anywhere near as much expertise as they do. And I think that, but what we recognize is there is an entire world of problems that need to be solved. And the, the pie of problems is easily big enough that in a way that, that it may be that IDEO doesn't have necessarily a unique differentiation as, as smarter than another consultancy that's offering services, but may end up through accident developing unique expertise that through, certainly through accident we end up developing unique expertises that we end up drawing through accident out of the expertise of the people that we work with. And I think that that's something that we find in this very collaborative mode of working to try to bring expertise into our own organization and facilitate it more than offer it in a, in a way. I'd like to comment on this as well. I think that what we're seeing is a change in the role of designers today. The designers are increasingly facilitators, as by the way are educators, increasingly not the source of all wisdom or insight, but facilitators of learning and facilitators of others working together. Because of our experiences, we can bring matters forward that help others contribute more effectively. So the, the change of a designer from an egocentric role to a facilitator, a massive change in our field, I think. D Jennifer, do you want to come? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think also, in, to add into that, the ethos of design has found a lot more widespread in general. I mean, the, the culture, today's culture of design and participation has reached um, the masses, multiple users, to the point that even though one may be not trained as a designer, one perceives himself or herself as a designer, and the technology tools allow for people to do that. So uh, there is an urgency for um, authorship and meaning and creating meaning and value in, in that participation, which was, sure. not, was not there, there, there before. It was relegated to the profession of designers. That's not the case anymore. That's a very nice point, I think. I like that a lot. Uh, Kenneth, do you no, want to add, add to that, too? I mean, I really love the point that we move now to a concern with the forms of relationship, because yes. that, that's going to be the, the genesis of whatever design we make. And, and I love appreciative inquiries as one of those. But I think what the invitation here is for a massive experimentation with other prototypes of how it is we could co-create yes. and the sharing of those. That is, there needs to be a common space so we can learn from each other about how you do this, how you bring in voices, which voices, how, for how long can you sustain the conversation? How can you create a conversation a, a, around the globe that is a conversation and it will stay with people? And these kinds of questions. I mean, we're, it's, a, it's sort of a new world of the co-creation of creation. Well, I like your point a lot, Kenneth. I think we are at a very different point in, in this matter. And, and in fact, if you think of the early stage of design, concerned with grammar and logic, the grammar of products and the logic of forms, today we've moved to two very different arts, arts of rhetoric and dialectic. I'm amazed how much we see these interactive qualities, being able to talk together, share ideas, but we're at a very special moment when we're exploring many ways of expressing this notion of dialectic that's coming into our culture. Appreciative inquiry is certainly one of those, but there are others too. Great, great points all along the way. Other questions, another question? Oh, there are a lot of people. Oh, yes, you've got it. Wow. Uh, I, guess I, I can't believe how rich what you've all said is in one panel, it's like, the power of uh, moving mountains here. It's a great group. Uh, um, and I'm trying to p pull together some thoughts on this whole notion of design for participation and who we are is based on who we've gotten information from. Uh, because one of the questions I wrestle with is how can the public find out how much better the world could be so that they will demand that better world of their leaders? I mean, the camera's back there, and if I could wave a magic wand, that would be C-SPAN, and this would be televised to everyone who watches C-SPAN, or it would be ABC, NBC, and CBS, 
and this would all be on the nightly news. Because I, I don't think that, you know, this whole notion of the wisdom of crowds, the public can't <clears throat> make things happen that they don't know can happen. But we know what can happen. So I'm wondering what you all think about some sort of massive communication effort that reaches the public at large, maybe leveraging the uh, collapse of uh, free market capitalism that Jason touched upon, because I personally think that's sort of a catalytic event that could allow us designers to talk about a next kind of fair market capitalism. But again, this issue of reaching the public, if you could address that. Thank you. That's a really nice uh, matter to bring up. How do we reach the, the, the public here? Uh, thoughts about this? Uh, Jason? Well, I actually, at the risk of making what could be seen as a political endorsement on a public panel. Take a risk. Uh, hey. For an organization <laughs> that does not make political endorsements, I would say that we've seen an instance of that in the last two years with a campaign, a political campaign run at the national level based on one word, hope, that resulted in a new president for this country who has founded an administration based on hope. And I think that that language, regardless of your political allegiances, I do think that the language that was used, was that was a massive communications campaign based on trying to picture a better world. And I think it represented, again, regardless of whether wh what side of the political fence you fall on, the structure of the campaign was a structure that said, this is how the world could be better and this is what it could look like against, against odds, frankly, of skepticism and a way of seeing the world that really I think that we don't, I have hope. <laughs> I have hope that maybe some of that dream could come true, but I think the structure of the campaign was important in designing a campaign that said the world could be better and laying out some of that. So I, I would say we already have that in place and I'm optimistic for that reason. Ooh. Kenneth, I saw your hand. Uh, yeah, I, I, just to pick up on the presidential influence, I mean, for me, it hasn't been the, the hope message, but the dialogue message. But time after time, the answer to most of these crucial problems has been, let's talk. Let's talk with what were the enemy. Let's bring them into the conversation. And that's, that's to me, a major reorientation of government and uh, one that is very promising. And I also think, uh, you know, coming out of education, about the function of education, I mean, on the one hand, the problem is that we try to teach certain knowledge, so we're kind of working against dialogue. On the other hand, there's been a lot of move in pedagogy towards more dialogic classrooms in which more voices are raised and issues can be discussed uh, both about the subject matter and its implications for the, for the world outside. And I like that move, but it's slow. It's very slow. Uh, Peter. For me, um, I'm, I'm very hopeful because uh, the, the emergence of things, of, of methodologies like appreciative inquiry, like World Cafe, where um, those groups are, are starting to realize the power of design and bring that into the process. And, and so it's not enough to come and sit and reach agreement about something, but you, by the time you've left the meeting, you've actually designed something, you've envisioned something together. And that, that's powerful, both because of the numbers and because of the process. Um, and, and so when you leave a meeting with a vision, a shared vision, that's something that is newsworthy and, and maybe, you know, CNN will pick that kind of stuff up. Yeah, I think, um, as I said, in picking up this theme, I think there are new design technologies as well as new design um, ideologies is, is charged with hope and innovation. And I think that comes right along with uh, the emergence of, of new techniques and new tools from physical computing to interaction design to rapid prototyping to um, uh, much of the uh, technologies that are available for social media. As I said before, I, I do believe that the design world has just expanded exponentially and, um, and, and there's a tremendous number of designers that are out there. Um, thinking themselves of designers and um, hoping to make a difference and actually taking action on that. Uh, much more than we may know even within the field of design. That's so um, I, I think like that's, a, that's a reality that's happening. I'd like to comment on this also. I have to tell you that 15 years ago, the people in this room would all be designers coming out of design firms and corporations. 15 years ago, designers talked to other designers. In the course of 15 years, through some carefully planned and some, uh, some, some very fortunate circumstances, 
Design has become a wider part of cultural communication. Business Week in the United States deserves a lot of credit for raising the profile of design, but certainly not the only. So today, in many newspapers around the country, you'll find columns on design. And in fact, I find myself in the last, the last 10 conferences I've been to, 10, 8, 10, I'm not speaking to designers primarily, I'm speaking to a wider community. Something has happened, and we now have designers speaking to other folks who are very interested and want to participate and can participate. So we're on a curve toward greater participation in this, and that's why a meeting like this is so important. <coughs> I don't personally believe in the wisdom of the crowds. I, I believe in the wisdom of communities if they're very fortunate and have good processes. I'm frightened of crowds and mobs, but I do like the idea of galvanizing people to think creatively and productively, and I think that's where the conversation about design is headed. And designers are more comfortable speaking. Instead of thinking that we live on a little fortress outside the periphery here, we actually believe we're just citizens. We're no different, no, no better, no worse. We know a few things, but other people know a lot. And that's been the theme here in the conversation. I like this very much. I was in South Africa, by the way. Uh, I was invited by the government to look at all of their design programs. And uh, I made a recommendation that they needed to create another six design, industrial design schools, following Jennifer's point. And they said, industrial design? We, we have a lot of industry, but not for six schools. I said, no, no, that's not the idea. If you educate industrial designers, they have the flexibility to move into many other areas of the culture, and it could be a very exciting time for, for South Africa. They have created a couple of new ones, not quite six, but they're getting there. That was an excellent question, though, really good. And to the point here, because you become spokesman for design as well in your practices. Time is very short, and I suspect we have one more question. Yes, you look like a serious gentleman. Great, thank you. Um, and this, I think, takes off on the last question. Looking at the, um, the 3D virtual world, and as, as sort of a trend watcher, what I'm seeing is I think it's getting a lot more egalitarian. If you look at phenomenons like Second Life, Google SketchUp, the 3D warehouse from Google, uh, what O'Reilly uh, publications have done with Make and Maker Faire, video gaming, IKEA fans, all of these things seem to be enabling users and consumers in the design process. So as they begin to participate, they've got free tools out there, the technology, um, they begin to do their own prototyping and simulations. Maybe it's the rise of the prosumer. Um, are we ready to engage them? Because I think they're ready to engage the realm of, in the world of design. That is, that is a great question. I wish I could paraphrase it in short form, but I think the, the panel understands this question very well. Who would like to speak to this one? Uh, maybe I, I can kick it off my, myself. Uh, one of the changes we're seeing in the field, I think you're catching, I would phrase it slightly differently. It used to be that designers designed artifacts and products in end use. Uh, I think there are many cases now where we designed the tools for designing. That fits with the notion of facilitation but also has deep implications for services and practices in communities. That we design the tools that enable others to design. And let's face it, some will do well and some will not do well. And it's part of our process of strengthening appreciation to make some judgments about what is good and bad in this. So the tools are spreading. I have no fear about that. Let everyone join in. I see design as a crossroads in the middle of a village not as a fortress of specialists and power on the outside. And I think those tools, those virtual tools, the participation, make for a very great community possibility for us. Uh, others have come in on this? I'm curious. Uh, Jennifer? I think you're raising an, an excellent point. It's a very important question. Um, as I was mentioning before, we, are, we launched an initiative called Programmable Environments in 2008, which speaks very much so and certainly tries to address and answer that question. We too have observed as many other colleagues in organizations as you and I think anyone who looks around the effective design participation and uh, tools that are given and very much so as, emergent, as, a, as a consequence of the emergence of technologies. One, there, we have four principles that we use to apply. I'll just talk about two real briefly. Um, one of them is that the user 
is a co-designer in a programmable environment. So the user co-designs that space, which is quite a departure from a design tradition, if you will. Uh, certainly if you've, if you've seen um, some of the things that um, we have done in the past. And, and everything in a programmable environment is both digital and physical. So in, in reference to Second Life or, or Makers or, or any of the other communities that are working into users as co-designers of artifacts of space and products, which is something that I think is, is fantastic and is very much um, a, a, new, a new way of understanding design and new forms and new ideas and expressions that are really rising from this new uh, tool, this new technology. I also want to bring up that there is, when we think there's a notion of scale that is important. Scale and massive innovation, uh, when we talk about social media, when we talk about technology in the purely digital sense, is very different than scale, obviously, in a physical environment. There are um, codes, laws, restrictions, physics, um, safety, fire safety, things that are required um, and professions that are licensed to be able and trained to be able to develop environments at a large scale. And those things for the foreseeable future will not really change, um, also because habitation uh, is, is quite a science, not only in art, uh, to develop those environments. But what we will see in the, in the near future is uh, the emergence of technologies that allow for at an environmental scale, so at an, not only at a product scale but at, at an architectural scale, the ability of the physical digital convergence, which as I was saying before, will clearly show us that users of environments will be able to be their co-designers. Very good, very good. Uh, Kenneth, you want to, and I'll come to, to you. Yeah, I contrast this really interesting question with an earlier one, which is how could we set in motion a larger movement, a larger consciousness, I mean, we're thinking globally here about organizing. Now, in contrast, the social networks really free up millions of voices, but they're all organizing in micro levels. There's, we've set in motion the possibilities for small, small circles to develop of all sorts who are also interested in sharing globally, ultimately, who really also want other people to participate with them. So whatever we're thinking of in terms of our sense of organization, we're also faced with millions of micro-organizations which are also at work creating their own goods and values and, and designs for the future. So it's something to take into account in our, our grand plans. Excellent point. Uh, Jason, you had a thought on this too. This raises a point for me that I feel like I have to make on the panel and see if I can get it stated concisely. Sometimes when I present to student audiences, I talk about a concept of deep practice, which I frame as my personal ambition in the world, to be a practitioner of deep practice in the sense of trying to figure out how can I make a deep, meaningful, positive impact in the world. And I do that particularly when I'm talking to students who are design students, who think of me as someone who's trained as a designer, think of themselves as people who are designers, and think about design as something that is a concrete discipline with concrete boundaries, and frankly, a discipline that has a tendency to look at all the practice that happens in the world and point to it and say, oh, that's design too, and that too. And that guy who's managing a business over there, that CEO, he's really a designer. And my skills can help him because I'm a designer and I can help him understand how to do his job better because, or her job as a CEO because I'm a designer and it's really all design. And I think that embedded in the language of design for a long time has been a tremendous hubris about what design can be and what it can do. And on a panel where we've been talking about humility, I think it's important to underline that point and say that, that it's not true that a, a, a woman running a large company as a CEO is necessarily at all times in her day a designer and that design will always be that helpful to her in thinking the problems that she has to face. It's a useful way of thinking along with many other useful ways of thinking. At other times, the discipline of community organizing may be a much more valuable discipline for her in running her business than the, than the discipline of design. And I say that because I think that in the conference, in this conference, we kind of skew between, comfortably skew between these different ways of talking about design as design that's something that's practiced by professionals and is changing in ways that many practices are changing in response to more participatory processes. And we're, sometimes because we, I think a lot about design, but my colleagues are constantly correcting me. They're scientists and engineers, and they say, look, 
just quit the design language, cut the design crap, and let's talk about what we're trying to do here. And so I think that so problem solving and creative problem solving and appreciative inquiry and community organizing and all these other practices are equally as valuable and important. It's important to recognize that in the context of a conference like this. Oh, I take that point uh, very much to heart. Uh, we're on the verge of a much deeper discussion of design, and we can't cross that boundary at the moment. But we've come right to that edge, because these are very powerful, important questions to us. Uh, I would say that there are a remarkable number of paradoxes, and you've pointed toward, toward one here. Uh, there are many kinds of design, and each operates under different kinds of constraints. There are some features in common and some that are not. So there's a, there's a, it's a tricky tool for us. But I, uh, I want to thank you all for participating in the panel. Thank you very much, and thank the audience for your, your role. Thank you very much. Excellent.